But look at, look at what Daniel said was going to happen. And we're going to examine this. Daniel said in the 6th century BC that at a future time, this thing was going to take place. Now, I'm not going to get into this abomination that causes desolation, uh, but in the context of where Daniel is, is talking, he's talking about one of the most described people in the Bible. He is called by more than 20 different terms. And he, we know him as the Antichrist. And on Sunday morning, Lord willing, the first seal that we're getting to in Revelation 6 is going to introduce him. And he is going to be the one that brings humanity what we've always looked for. He's going to bring world peace. Did you know there's going to be world peace? There's going to be an absence of war on this planet. And there's going to be a man, a politician, a man who can talk like nobody's talked before since Christ. And he's going to get everybody behind him. And that's the first seal. We're going to come to that. But in the midst of what he does, he is going to set up an abomination that causes desolation in the holy place. So what that means is that Jesus told his disciples that Daniel was right when Daniel said that at the end of the world, there was going to be a temple in Jerusalem that the Jews worship. That's what the holy place is. And that there was going to be an idol put into that place. See so you know what that means? It means there has to be a nation Israel. That means that God's going to have to preserve the Jewish people for 2,600 years from 600 B.C. to we're now 2,613 years later. And they're going to have to continuously exist and not get exterminated. But they're going to have to be identifiably back in Jerusalem. And that happened in the last half of the last century. And so we're, we're starting to chart. We are alive in what the Old Testament calls the, the last or final generation. It's very interesting uh, that, that we are seeing a time in history that is uh, astounding. Okay. Daniel 9 is the most amazing prophetic chapter of all. And the reason I say that is, real quickly before we go, Daniel 9 is a prayer. Daniel is studying the Bible and he is praying through the scripture, praying for his people, praying, and all of a sudden his prayer is interrupted by Gabriel. And if Gabriel's important. Gabriel's the one that announces that Jesus is coming. And Gabriel's the one that, that is, is there and, and speaking um, into the, the events for the children of Israel. But Gabriel visits and gives to Daniel, in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, a very interesting prophecy. And we just have enough time to read it. So turn to Daniel 9. I want to show you something. You've never seen it before. This is the most amazing prophecy in the Bible. Basically has four parts. Uh, you know, if you like uh, three-point sermons with a poem, this is almost that good. It talks about the scope of God's plan for history in verse 24. Then it talks about a period of time called 69 weeks. Then it says there's this period where, it, it, like the clock, you know, is off. Uh, the game, you know, when they're running around and measuring and everything, the clock's not running. There's an interval period. And then there's a final segment of time. And this 70th week is where we get the seven-year tribulation from. So let, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, in your Bibles... Verse 24, 70 weeks. Now, it, it doesn't really say weeks. It's actually a, an interesting term that in English would be the word heptads. It's like the word dozens. What does dozens mean? It means groups of what? Twelves, yeah. Heptads means groups of sevens. So this a heptatic structure is revolving around the number seven. So it says 70 heptads are determined upon thy people. So what we're seeing is the scope of history, God says, is all God has, has designed all history is, is surrounding the people he chose way back 
21 centuries before Christ. In Ab- oh, he chose them eternity past, but, but he revealed it to us in Abraham's time. The Jews, the descendants of Judah, uh, the Yehudim, the Jews. So Daniel's people are the Jews, and God determines 70 heptads. What is 7 times 7? Seven? 7 times 7 is 49. So 7 times 70 would be 490. So God says, I have planned 490 years for the Jewish people. And not just for the Jewish people. Remember the UN wanted to give them Rhodesia or something, you know, some land out in Africa? Doesn't work. God says, I have put my plan for those Jewish people, and it's totally bound up with the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. And then he says, and, and this is a study in itself, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Wow, what on earth is that? There's only one thing. There's only one thing that finished transgressions, made an end of sin, reconciled iniquities, and brought in everlasting righteousness, and that's the cross of Christ. And so something in this 490 years involves Christ dying on the cross, and this 490 years also seals up the vision and prophecy and anoints the most holy place. So something big is happening. So that's what verse 24 is about the scope. Part two, remember there are four parts, is the 69 weeks. Now look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. So uh, Artaxerxes tells them that they can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So from that command unto Messiah the King. Now if you read the Gospels, you see that Palm Sunday, as we call it, Jesus comes in and, and they're saying, Hosanna, save us, and you're the king. And, and, and they say, tell the people to stop saying that. They told Jesus. Jesus said, if they didn't say it, the rocks would cry out. Because it was a very important day to God. It was the day that Jesus Christ offered himself to the Jewish people as their king. And they rejected him as their king. And so he died as the savior of the world. But what's interesting is seven heptads and three score is 60 and two. So we have, we have seven plus 60 plus two. So we have 69 heptads, hep, groups of seven, which equals 483 years. So something is going to happen in that time period. Basically, what he's saying is the 69 weeks go from when the commandment came from the secular king that they could restore Jerusalem until Jesus offered himself, you know, Zechariah 9.9, Behold, your king comes, meek and lowly, sitting on the colt of a donkey. And, And when Jesus came riding into town on the donkey and they threw their clothes down, their cloaks, and put the palm branches, it was 483 years. Now, if you look on the calendar, actually it's, it's 445 B.C. to 30 A.D., and that's 475 years, but they have not always calculated years as 360 days. We have a Gregorian calendar. We also have the Julian calendar. There have been so many corrections. But if you look at Jewish years, which are 360-day years, not 364 and a half or five and a quarter years, uh, it's wonderful mathematics. The Royal Astronomy uh, Astronomical Society of Britain worked it out. But look what Jesus said when he came for Palm Sunday. When he was come near in Luke 19, beheld the city, he wept over it, saying, if you had known even you at least in this thy day. Jesus said when he rode into town, it was their day. And it was what was promised would happen that Messiah would offer himself as king. And then Jesus said, because you didn't know your day, the day will come upon thee and the enemy shall cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, keep thee on every side, and mow you down. Basically, After the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement that Daniel 9.26. This is the heart of the gospel. That 
The, the promised Savior would be cut off, not for himself. And look at this. And this is where we'll have to pick up next time. This is fascinating. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. Now we know when that happened. After, notice it says after this Jesus announcing himself as Messiah, that the people of the prince that shall come, the Romans, are going to come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And the end, therefore, shall be with a flood, and unto the end wars and desolations are determined. Then, if you want to see a chart of it, verse 25 says there's going to be this 69-week period that ends at what we call Palm Sunday, or Christ riding into town, offering himself as the Messiah. Then after that 69 weeks ends, after it, Messiah would be cut off, that's the cross, and the city of Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. And it just goes, mm. you know, it's kind of like TVs used to go, when the programming ended, it just hummed. That's the interval. But verse 27 down here is what is the most remarkable thing. I stopped with you on verse 26. What does verse 27 say? If you look down at your Bible, it says, Look at these words. And he, the prince, shall enforce covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause. You see, if you counted and did the math, there's one week left out. God has accounted for his time clock stopped after 69 weeks. And that stopping, after the clock stopped, Christ was crucified, Jerusalem was destroyed, and it's going to hum for a while. But the prince that shall come, wait a minute, what prince is that? The people of the prince shall come and destroy the city. Who destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. What empire destroyed Jerusalem and the temple? The Romans. The people of the prince that shall come. So what it's saying is, that's where we get the revived Roman Empire. Uh, in the midst of the week, this prince that shall come, this, this antichrist that is somehow involved with this revived Roman Empire is going to enforce the covenant for one week. That's seven years. There's where we get the tribulation from, right there. And in the midst of the week, now you've heard of mid-trib, that's where the middle is. The midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And that's where we're going to... Let's begin this evening uh, looking at the question that I was just finishing up last week. What is Daniel 9 talking about? And it's talking about the most amazing prophetic chapter in the whole Bible. And, and the only thing I want to remind you of before we dig into Ezekiel is this, that God wants us to know about the future. Think about it, that it, it's not Hal Lindsey that thought all this up. It, it's not John Walvert of Dallas Seminary that thought all this up. It's not even J.N. Darby of the Plymouth Brethren that thought all this up. God is the one who in the book of Isaiah said, test me to know that I am the Lord. Do you know the things that are going to happen in the future? Because only I do, saith the Lord. And so what, what we see is prophecy was built by God for the purpose of helping us know the future. And so it, it's not like it's the fringe of Christendom that's into this. God is into it. And he's devoted, as we saw last week, a fourth of his book into uh, things to come. And so real quickly, what we saw in, in Daniel 9, the most amazing prophetic chapter in the Bible is this. There's so many pieces. Um, those four verses, 24, 25, and 26, and 27, basically tell us the scope of history, then specifically the 483 years, the church age, we would call it, it's just a, an interval, and then the last seven years. Uh, the scope is, God says he's determined that there are 490 years of history that revolve around the Jewish people. Remember, in God's map, Jerusalem's in the center, his people his chosen people of promise. Uh, and it surrounds the Jews in Jerusalem. It lasts 483 years. You say, how do you get 483 years? Well, it says uh, there shall be uh, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Um, seven plus 62 makes 69 weeks. And if you look, uh, 
69 times 7 uh, weeks of years. And by the way, if you want to track this down, you'll find that this word that's used here is used in other parts of the Old Testament for kind of like we would use dozens, and it uses sevens. But that's where we come with the 483 years. And uh, the third part is, notice the wording, after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So we know that's the crucifixion. Um, the crucifixion takes place after this time period. But this time period, if you, if you look here, there are 69 weeks that are talked about that are from the, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until actually God's counter ended on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a bigger deal. It, you know, I mean, it's the, the triumphal entry of Christ. You know, some people wonder if it's really on Sunday, but it doesn't matter. What we call Palm Sunday is very big in God's calendar. It's the end of this period of his plans for Israel. And it ended when they, as it were, rejected Jesus as their king. They, they rejected him. And so following that, the time clock stopped, but Christ was crucified and Jerusalem was destroyed. And there's an indeterminate amount of time. It's, it's called an interval. It's just, God says, 69 weeks, one week. And that's what makes 70. But between the end of the 69th right here and the beginning of the final one, the 70th, is an indeterminate amount of time. And you say, well, what's it for? It's what the Bible calls till the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in. And I love it that some Bible teachers say that, that God has this, this clock, uh, this counting clock, and it's counting up time and people that are coming. And when the last one that he desires to enter into the church of Christ enters, Boom. I mean, you're going to be out. In fact, uh, if you want to, it says hastening the day of the Lord. You want to hasten the day of the Lord, lead people to the Lord. Because you hasten when the last one that he has chosen for this time period to be saved is saved. Boom. Then he takes his church out and it starts that 70th week. So we already covered this last week. The last seven years uh, is, is in Daniel 9.27. And he, that's the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. And see, this, this whole uh, Daniel 9 thing is built around these heptads, these weeks of years, seven years. And so he's going to enforce a covenant for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and determination will be poured out in the desolate. I mean, all that is saying is everything that it chronicles. When you look at Revelation 13 and you, you see this Antichrist coming and this image he sets up of himself and the, the uh, breaking of the covenant and, and tricking the Jewish people who were trusting in the false Messiah. And I'm looking forward in a, in a couple of weeks when we get on Sunday morning to the first seal of Revelation 6. The first seal is a white horse. The first event that the Lord unfolds for us is the rise of this man that is the ultimate superman in every way. Super intellect, super communicator, super... Uh, you know, mesmerizer of audiences. I mean, Hitler could keep the Munich Stadium absolutely mesmerized with his orations and his everything he did. This fellow will be able to mesmerize not just, you know, Munich or, or uh, Germany. He will mesmerize the world and, and will give everybody what they always wanted uh, for a while. Uh, so that led us to the second question, where does this term seven-year tribulation come from? It's right there. It's this idea that, that God had 483 years, whoop, 483 years or uh, 69 heptads that ended, and there's this interval, but the last section, the last week, the 70th week, is seven years long. And this, this 70th week period is called uh, the, the tribulation or the, as it says in chapter 6 on, uh, at the end of 6, the great 
tribulation. Uh, now, this is something that we're going to cover tonight. There is a prophesied two-chapter event in Ezekiel that, that describes the Magog invasion of Israel. The, you notice this and this and this? It's not clear in the Bible when it takes place. And so what we're going to do tonight is just, you know, it, it's understand what's going to happen, understand the, the participants, but we don't know if it, if it falls right here before the tribulation. It could actually happen. It, it isn't clear whether it happens, uh, you know, sometime in, in you know, like, like near the time of Armageddon, any time during the week, before the week, uh, it's just not clear, and I'll show you why. But what we do know is that there's a rebuilt temple in this time period because in the center at the three-and-a-half-year mark, right here, right in the center of the tribulation, the Antichrist uh, defiles, sets up the image of himself, and, and uh, breaks the covenant and all the things we read about in Revelation. So this is where the seven-year tribulation comes from. It's that 70th week. That is, that is culminated by the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. And that launches into the personal direct rule of Christ called the millennium. Okay, now what's interesting, go to Daniel 10. I want to show you something because uh, I wanted to throw this in because someone mentioned it. It's probably uh, they were reading Peretti books or something, you know, I don't know. But look in Daniel 10 because... Where did this idea of spiritual warfare on a global scale come from? And, and sometimes we, we uh, in our reading this, we don't really notice some of the things that, that it's talking about. Uh, first of all, in Daniel 10, if you read the whole chapter, you see that, that Daniel is fasting for three weeks. Now that immediately, um, when Jesus' disciples confronted a very powerful demon situation, Jesus said to them, this kind cometh not, but by what? Yeah. This kind cometh not, but by, remember God always puts this word first, and fasting. Uh, prayer in God's book is always first. But we will give ourselves to prayer in the ministry of the word. This kind cometh not but by prayer and by fasting. And so prayer is, is a reference to our seeking God. Fasting is us denying ourself, our flesh. Uh, you know, the, the idea of um, that, that I am so weak, I need to seek God's strength. And I am, my flesh is so strong, I need to deny it. So first I start seeking the Lord, and then I start, you know, denying uh, the, the, the enemy within, the traitor, my flesh. So Daniel is, is already seeking the Lord, and he goes into this three-week fast, and the Lord dispatches a messenger to him, but for the whole fasting period the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, you know what's so interesting? Movie makers read the Bible. I mean, that was a movie a while back, The Prince of Persia. And I thought, do they know what they're talking about? Because there is a demon that is, that is behind this moment, what the Persians are doing in their hatred of Israel. And it is so interesting to think about the dark side, what we, you know, we don't even realize so much of, of, of it's not just uh, nation states buying, uh, you know, hypersonic missiles and, and Israel intercepting them and blowing them up last week. There's so much more going on, on the spiritual realm. That God, interestingly enough, in this chapter is one of the only places in the Bible, I mean, other than Job 1 and 2 that we've already looked at, pulls back for a moment the curtain because he wants us to know that there is so much going on that this is why the Bible says God is watching over his word to perform it because Satan doesn't understand the Bible and doesn't know what God is doing, but he's going to try and stop it at every hand. And so there is this, 
this higher level of warfare. And so this prince of the kingdom of Persia, this, this order of demon creatures, remember Paul describes seven orders of demons, prince valleys and powers, and you know, he goes through all these you know, spiritual weakness in high places when he's talking about it. And if you add them up with the ones that are in the Old Testament, it appears that there are seven orders of demons that reflect the seven orders, you know, cherubim and seraphim and the archangel, Lucifer that was the anointed cherub. I mean, you know four right off, top, plus normal angels. So, um, but, but uh, until Michael, and Michael is the one that seems to always be the defender of God's chosen people who promised the Jews. So Michael comes in and, and uh, this messenger going to that's on his way to Daniel, is hindered by this, this being. So Michael uh, comes and assists this angel to get to Daniel. And after giving Daniel, after that messenger gets to Daniel, this angel, and gives him chapter 11 and 12, he will have to deal with, and here's another one, it appears to be one of these hierarchy of demons that is, that is influencing the nation of Greece. So all, all that to say, in a little while when we're looking at the maps, uh, we think of armies and soldiers and political leaders, and God sees overlaid over all that. Satan is just like in Job. Satan incited the Sabaeans to go and attack Job's flocks. Satan incited, and, and if you read, Satan can actually incite people groups to, to terrorize and kill and fight and war. He can drive them just like the demon of Gadara, the de demonized man. So this is very interesting, but I, I just wanted you to see where that comes from. What are your thoughts on the probable timing of Ezekiel's Russian invasion where God shows himself supernaturally protecting his people? Well, immediately, see, this is what the discipline of truth is. Where in the world would it say anything about that? See, that's what we're supposed to know. Not the professionals. We're supposed to know that. That's what the discipline of truth is. When you hear of something, it should draw your mind to some portion of the Bible because you've read the Bible enough. You know it better than your sports statistics, more than you know, you know the, the latest goings-on of... Uh, uh, Bonnie and I were trapped in traffic going between two points in Los Angeles, and finally we found out what it was. It was one of these and we were actually cutting between two places and ended up on Hollywood Boulevard, and it was a premiere, and all these black limousines, and people were getting out in their little gowns, you know, and police were everywhere. And I said, wonder what that is, you know? We're so out of touch, and it was some premiere of some movie. But, boy, if you talk about this, I know where it is. See, where is your treasure? Is it in heaven? Then you know the Word of God. Is it on earth? You, you know what premiere it was in Hollywood, last week. Um, the two places you look are Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Daniel 9. So quick, open your Bibles, and we have exactly eight minutes, and I'll try and answer this uh, fast. When I was little, they used to have uh, 16 and a half, 33, 45, and 78, I think, were the speeds of the record player, which was a flat pancake thing that spun with a needle. <laughs> And so we will go from, I've been going at 16 and 33, we'll go 45 and 78 soon. So the question is, do Russia, the Arab Muslims, and the current events fit anywhere in Daniel 9? First of all, what is Daniel 9? Here's Daniel 9. I printed out for you. Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks, and I would add that the Bible shows us that actually is not 70 seven-day weeks but it's 70 heptads of 490 years. And I'll show you why. Upon thy people, little interpretation, that's the Jews, thy holy city, Jerusalem. So God says, basically, I have 490 years planned for the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem to do all these things. Okay, now look at the next verse. Now, therefore, and understand, from the going forth of the command to restore. And if you know anything about history, you know that in about... 445 B.C., the Persian, Iranian, king made a decree. You can read about it in, in uh, uh, 
the last chapter of Ezra, and you can read about it in the first chapter of uh, Second Corinth or Chronicles. But this decree goes out to rebuild the the city of Jerusalem's walls and the temple, and. Uh, from that point, 445 B.C., and you can look that up. By the way, I checked. I always say this, and I checked this morning, went to Wikipedia. Pff, first thing, right there, in that collect all of a lot of junk. They had the right date in there, praise the Lord. On to Messiah the King. We know that's about 30 A.D. Jesus was crucified. Shall be, now look at this, set, we have to do a little math within sets and closed sets, okay? Three score is 60 and two. So 60 plus 7 plus 2. So there's something going on for 69 of these weeks. And what will happen is the streets will be built of Jerusalem, the wall of Jerusalem, and troublesome time. How would we possibly know that Daniel is talking not about, you know, 70 weeks, which is like one year and 18 weeks, one year, four months, and two weeks. How do we know he's not talking about a year and a quarter? Well, just plug in, just do a little math. From the command to restore Jerusalem was in 445 B.C. Messiah the king was heralded on Palm Sunday in 30 A.D. And if you do a little math and, and take those years, actually that is 475 you know, years if you look at that. But if you take 360 day which is what Hebrew calendars were, a lunar calendar, uh, and, and divide that time period down today, you find it exactly as 483 years, which is just what the Lord said. The 60 plus 2 plus 7, right up to the time of Messiah. Now let's go back to the text, verse 26. After these three score and two, plus the seven that has already been mentioned, after these 69 weeks or 483 years, something is going to happen. After that, Messiah will be cut off. What's that? That's the crucifixion. The Messiah was crucified. And not for himself. It's a substitutionary atonement. And the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city. Who crucified Jesus and who destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70? What, what nation of people? Romans, okay. So the Romans, see, all of this is, is uh, very historically uh, validated. The, the people that destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple were the Romans. But notice what it says. The people, the Romans of, whoa, who's that? The prince that shall come, we know him, we meet him in Revelation 13, beast. He's the anti-Christ. He, this is where we get the concept of the revived Roman Empire. It's not how Lindsay didn't think of that. Uh, God thought of that. God said the same people that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple is going to produce a prince that shall come. And what is he going to do? And he, this is the very next verse, so the antecedent is the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many. Oh, there's the last week. Remember, we have 69 accounted for. But in the future, there's one left, and it's right there. And, oh, in the middle of it. So if a week is seven years, in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he's going to cause, and this little line right here, Jesus, Paul, and John all believed that was true, that there was a future time, that this bad guy, the Antichrist, is going to stop the sacrifice and the oblation. Is there a temple in Jerusalem today? No. There hasn't been one since A.D. 70. But Jesus, Paul, John, and Daniel, in the future, 
for one week saw this temple. And he is going to make it desolate. And what, I mean, if you've read the rest of the book, in chapter 13 of Revelation, it says that he sets up an image of himself and wants to be worshipped as God. This Antichrist savior of Israel that defends them at their darkest hour comes in. So that's the backdrop for, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Okay, here's verse 25 of Daniel, 69 weeks, 7 plus 62. It ends with Christ being cut off and the desolation and there's this period that's not determined how long it is until this final section this last week that is bisected by a half. And at the halfway point, the Antichrist shows his true colors and uh, turns on Israel. The Bible says that there is a future Jewish temple during the tribulation in Jerusalem. So during the tribulation in Jerusalem is this temple, and this temple is what prompts the the entire unleashing of the prophecies about the end of the world. So verse 1 of chapter 11, I was given a read to measure. John is, is just seeing and measuring what Jesus saw. Now remember, four people see this temple. That's how we know it's going to be there. Now you see, why, are, why am I spending so much time talking about this? Because half of all Christians do not believe that there are going to be either one of these temples. They say this is all figurative, it's talking about the church, yet Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, flee to the mountains. So Jesus, when he's talking about the birth pangs that we saw uh, about five or six lessons ago, uh, you know, Matthew 24 and the signs of the end. When Jesus was giving that sermon, he said, as the world is ending, when you see the abomination of, that causes desolation standing in the temple, flee to the mountains. Jesus saw a tribulation temple. Paul saw the same thing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul said that this one who makes himself God and calls himself God is going to raise up and put an image of himself and cause false worship in a temple in Jerusalem at the end, after the rapture of the church. So Jesus saw this temple. Paul saw this temple. Daniel saw this temple in Daniel chapter 9. He said in Daniel chapter 9 and uh, verses starting in verse 24, and let me get there with you. Uh, it says this, Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people. And verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So from the rebuilding of the destroyed Solomon temple, there is going to be 483 years. Now we know to the day that, that that is truly what happened because this was destroyed and, and then Cyrus sends them back and lets them have the, the lumber and you remember Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and all that and they start rebuilding the temple and 483 years are clocked there. But then it says, keep going to verse 26, and after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Now we've gotten to the crucifixion of Christ right here. And Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. Whoa. The people of the prince that is to come. This prince, this, this person, the Antichrist, has... So the Antichrist has 33 different names in the Bible. Prince to come is one of them. But look what it says in this verse. But the people of the prince who is to come, that's the tribulation antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. AD 70, who destroyed Herod's temple? The Romans. Now that's where, now... If you've ever heard of the revived Roman Empire and that the Antichrist is going to be coming out of the revived Roman Empire, it's because Daniel 9.26 says 
the people of the prince that will come are the ones who destroyed the temple in AD 70. All that is from this amazing prophecy. So well, again, I remind you, this whole event we're talking about, this whole temple, and everything that's going on here in chapter 11, 12, and 13, see on the map, or I mean the slide in front of you, that's Daniel 9, 24 to 27. God's prophetic word in Daniel is directed at the future of Israel. See, that's where the confusion comes in. It's not the church. All of this has nothing to do with the church. The church is around the throne. This has to do with Israel. Do you see that the tribulation is for Israel? Basically, you could summarize the tribulation this way. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until the Jews are with nowhere to turn. They've all been kind of pushed back into the promised land, back into the holy land, back into basically Jerusalem. The Antichrist, this worst man that ever lives, is hemming them in. He's assembled the biggest army the world's ever seen, what we would call the Battle of Armageddon. They're all gathering at Armageddon. They're going to march together to annihilate the Jewish people in Jerusalem. John Barnett here, and welcome to Daniel chapter 9. You can be turning in your Bibles uh, to Daniel 9. I've got mine open. We're in the 52 greatest chapters of the Bible. And I, by the way, do read the notes that you all send. One of you just sent me a note this morning, and they said, you need to not just put number 23. You need to put your old abbreviation you used to use, FTGC, 52 Greatest Chapters. Now, there is a serious student. Thank you for being a part of our small group. Uh, we're in a year-long journey looking at the Bible from cover to cover looking at all the big doctrines, the, the theological truths, the attributes of God, the what I call the mega themes. But today, among the greatest chapters of the Bible, is a chapter for many believers that is obscure. And I hope that after we get through today, it becomes what I call it, one of the most important chapters in the framework, in the scripture, in the doctrine of all the Bible, Daniel 9 has, has so many of the vital doctrines. Let me show you what I mean. Daniel chapter 9, and here's the title. Remember, the title of the lesson is always, after my whole week of studying and journaling everything together uh, from with you in this study, I write my last title, and it's on the slide. And here's my title. Jesus said, a temple for Israel will be operating, by that I mean offering sacrifices, animal sacrifices, in Jerusalem. So Jewish people operating a temple in Jerusalem at the start of the tribulation. Wow. Now that... If you sit back and think what that means, what I'm saying right there is huge for your understanding of the Bible. Here's, here's where it's said. Jesus said, when you see the abomin abomination of desolation uh, standing where he should not stand, which is the holy place, then let those in Jerusalem flee to the mountains. So Jesus, in Matthew 24, affirmed that in the city of Jerusalem, in the future, at the end of the world, Jewish people were going to be living in the city of Jerusalem with their own temple, and it's going to have a holy of holies, and it's going to have sacrifices, just like Daniel said. Now, look at those other pictures. Here's what the temple looked like in the Jewish times. Uh, that's actually Solomon's temple, and then it was recreated by uh, Zerubbabel, and then it was enlarged and beautified by Herod. But look what's right there right now. el -Aqsa, and the Dome of the Rock. So Jesus said, this is going to be here somehow. <laughs> wow, that's all I can say. Jesus is giving us a simple map. That's why we want to look at Daniel 9. Uh, Jesus offers us a map of the future. Now, I have, you know, Google Maps, and I use them all the time, and you use them all the time. This is a flawlessly accurate guide for us to understand history, past history, 
how to fit together all that's gone on in the past, what's going on in the present. And every day, a little discipline I have is I scan the headlines of the major uh, news outlets of the world, uh, the English speaking world, the Asian world, the whole Russian you know, orb, Africa, South America, and of course, our area. And so looking at all those, I, I am always filing articles that explain the present goings on and how they fit with the scriptures. That's the framework all of us need to have. That's the framework I hope that you're gaining from this Bible study. And we're always looking toward the future because God Almighty who rules from heaven over all the affairs of mankind gave to Daniel the snapshot of all the ages all the time from when Daniel lived right at the beginning of the Medo-Persian Empire all the way to the end of the history of the world. And God says, this is all there will be from Daniel's time to the end. Now, that's very comforting because a lot of people, I mean, they think, oh, we're going to colonize Mars. I'm going to go with, you know, uh, SpaceX and, and the moon, and we're going to someday and all this. And you know what God says? He says, no, actually... The real end of the world is not kind of like Star Trek or Star Wars or Avengers. The real end of the world is that all the problems we have right now in this world are going to become like birth pangs. The weather problems we have, the climate change problems we have, the food shortage problems we have, the water shortage problems we have, the pollution problems we have, the ethnic strife going on and increasing more than I ever remember in my lifetime. It just seems to be constantly the rioting and, and all the civil unrest, and not just in America. It's going on. There are riots in Rome. There are riots in Paris. There are riots in Berlin. There are riots in London. Uh, they're rounding up people in Russia and putting them in jail. China is, the, is kind of at the forefront of all this. There are all kinds of civil and ethnic strife. And you know what the Bible says? All those are just going to get worse and worse and worse till the end, like birth pangs. Next slide. Daniel's prophecy is an end of days roadmap, and especially when we focus on verses 24 to 27. But let's start going through uh, the, the details. There's a future Jewish temple during the tribulation in Jerusalem. How do I know that? Jesus saw it in Matthew 24. Paul saw it in 2 Thessalonians 2. Daniel sees it in the passage we're studying today. John sees it and describes it in Revelation chapter 11. Jesus says, Jerusalem, for all of us, and, and every time you see the news, hear the news, watch the news, read anything, Jerusalem is God's clock counting down the end of the world. Now, I have a clock right over there that tells me we're in the eighth minute of this Bible study. And that Often when I used to speak, there would be a countdown clock in different places because they were timed and classes and 50-minute segments. Do you know what God's countdown to the launching of the tribulation is? Jerusalem. The close of world history is tied to that little city called Jerusalem. All of the world will focus on Jerusalem. In fact, next week, Lord willing, and I've had such, such a blessing studying Daniel, this week, but I can't wait to introduce to you Zechariah. Because you know what Zechariah says? It says that Jerusalem is going to become a, a burden stone around the neck of the whole world. It's kind of like everybody's going to be weighed down by what's going on in Jerusalem. It's going to become a burden globally. I actually have a little file in Evernote where I put all of the global burdens that the world has about Jerusalem. Little notes like, there have been more United Nations resolutions against Israel than any other country since they've been keeping records. Did you know that there are more weapons being purchased that are surrounding the nation of Israel than any other part of the world? I mean, 
all of the Arab nations, all of the Arab nations are arming themselves. Did you see the United Arab Emirates just bought, I think it was 60 billion, maybe 100 billion, I don't know, billions of dollars worth of F-35 stealth bombers. What, what, what do they need that much armament for? Iran just inked a multi, multi, multi billion dollar deal with China. They already have a mega billion dollar deal with Russia. Saudi Arabia, a hundred billion dollars of arms. Israel, Israel just constantly is on the forefront. That's going to cause the world to focus because you see, Israel and Jerusalem are going to be the tinderbox that's going to start a nuclear conflagration. Everyone always says, you know, Russia and America or China and America. No, no. The one you need to worry about is when an atomic warfare begins around the Middle East. The wrath of God will be poured out in the tribulation. Fall in human history will culminate with Jesus' descent to the Mount of Olives. Look, in Jerusalem, you see this? Jerusalem, 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 as Earth's creator returns to Jerusalem. That is the center of the world to God. Jesus said, and that's the lesson as we jump into Daniel 9, that a temple for Israel will be operating in Jerusalem when the tribulation starts. It's not going to be as glorious as Solomon's temple, it's not going to be 40 acres, probably, like Herod's temple was, but it's going to be the third temple, Revelation 11, during the tribulation. Now, there's another one coming. This one is really going to be big. This one is going to be about 50 square miles. That's going to be huge. The whole It's going to be God's visitor center, and we cover that. Uh, in the Isaiah course, so I won't go over that now. But let me get into my journal. And this is a little different. I thought, instead of showing you the typed up version first, I'm going to show you the rough copy first, okay? So here we go. Daniel 9, the most amazing passage in the Bible. And I just, just now, I went like this, and I took my phone, and I took a picture of my Bible that I have worked on all week long, scratching notes in. You can see, you know, I even use all different colored pens. And, and first, I did this. This is Daniel's prayer for the people of Israel. That's what the ninth chapter starts with. Then I noted the Acts model. You ever heard of the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, prayer model? Have you ever gone on Wednesday night to prayer meeting or to, you know, some college prayer meeting or some concert of prayer of believers? And they say, let's do the Acts prayer model. We'll start out adoring the Lord before we get into all of our prayer requests. And then we're going to make sure that he hears us by going through a time of confession and repentance. And then we'll offer thanksgiving to him for all of his blessings. Then we get to supplication. Where did that wonderful idea for prayer, <laughs> the original one's right here. Now, I did write this, because look, in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, in the lineage of the Medes, by the way, who are the Medes? They're the Kurds. Whenever you're uh, looking at the news, Kurdistan is actually Media, the Medo-Persian Empire. That's why the Kurds and the Iranians are always having trouble, and the the Iraqis and the Kurds, and the Turks and the Kurds. Why? Because the Medo-Persian Empire, notice what's first, Medo-Persian Empire. They were the strong, strong half of the Medo-Persian Empire. The, the Kurds are very militant and warlike, and Turkey's always fighting them, and Iran is fighting them, and Iraq is fighting them. But right there, Darius was a Mede, and he took over the realm of the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. Look it up in Wikipedia. That's exactly, I wrote that in my Bible because that is a historic marker. We know exactly when verse 1 took place. 
five, it's somewhere 538, 539. There's a hyphen in it usually in Wikipedia. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. Whoa, did you catch that? He is studying prophecy. Daniel is reading the Bible. He's a prophet of God, and yet part of his personal life was kind of like Paul's and Jesus's and everybody else's. They studied the Bible. Jesus studied the Bible. Jesus memorized the Bible, the Old Testament, as he was growing up and quoted it. Do you see how important the Word of God has always been? And even more is today as we live in the what Jesus calls the last days. Jesus said, we're living in the last days. You and I are. Paul said that we're in the last days. And if Paul was in the last days, we're really in the last days, okay? But look at this. Daniel understood by the book the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So that intrigued me. Now, remember, we use the MacArthur Study Bible. I looked down at the MacArthur Study Bible, and I read the footnote. And what did the footnote say? It says, go to Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12. Do you know what Jeremiah said? He said that there's going to be 70 years of desolation. Now, I wonder what 70 years of desolation means. Does it mean a long time? Does it mean a hard time? Does it mean seven ages or seven eons? Or s- you see, that way of studying the Bible, saying, I wonder what 70 means, is called allegorizing. It, it means saying that the words represent something else other than what they say. But how did Daniel understand Jeremiah? I wrote it over here. He said it was literal. Think about that. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests and prayer, supplications with fasting in sackcloth and ashes. So he starts a prayer time. After he understood the prophecy that 70 years were were determined for his people, he started thinking about, wow, I remember Jerusalem was destroyed in 586. And look, that time period is going by. And so I want to start praying for the Lord to fulfill his promise. And he does fulfill his promise. Within a few years, the return of Zerubbabel takes place and the rebuilding of the temple. And that's what Daniel's praying for. So here comes the Acts model right here. Adoration starts. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, now what what does his prayer start with? O Lord, great and awesome God. What do you call that? That's adoration of God. You are the covenant keeper. You are merciful to us who love you and with those who keep your commandments. He's adoring the Lord. But immediately he goes from adoration to what? Confession. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly, verse 5, and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Do you remember Psalm 119? The precepts, the judgments, the law. It's, it's the divine lawgiver telling us what he wants. Now, this one, this one is really good. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and to all the people of the land. That's the, the, the way that the scriptures speak to all of us. That is the voice of God. He continues, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all of Israel, those near and far, you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they committed against you. All sin is against God. You know, we always look at people that we harm, and we, we always think about that dimension. But did you know, though there are people in life that our sin affects, only a few of them does it affect, but all our sin affects God. And you see how he's confessing. He is identifying. And he said, O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings and our princes and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. So adoration, the confession is continuing. 
we have rebelled, verse 9. Now, I like this. He says, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servant, the prophets. Right there is why I say, you've probably heard me if you've been in this course very long. I say that I hear the voice of God when I read the Bible. Why do I say that? I always have people that go, whoa, in the comments, they go, what are you saying? You actually hear audible voices? I said, no. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Just like Daniel said. Daniel said, when you read the Bible, like I'm reading it out loud to you right now, when I read the scriptures, you're hearing God speaking. He's using my voice, but you don't need my voice. All you need to do is read the scriptures. One of the habits I have in the car when I drive on my iPhone I've downloaded the uh, Hosanna audio Bible by Faith Comes by Hearing. It's an outfit that has the Bible in every language of the world, and they supply it for missionaries. And they have a dramatized New International Version audio Bible free for download. And I've downloaded all of it. And I used to, when I was speaking up um, in one place way in upstate New York, and I used to have to drive between meetings 30 minutes each way, I could drive and cover a whole book of the Bible, like, you know, one of the Old Testament books or many of the New Testament books in an hour of audio Bible reading with drama. So listen to the voice of God. Boy, that's an important verse right there. Yes, all Israel has transgressed. We have sinned. Look at all this confession. We've transgressed. We've sinned. But then look. And he's confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, our judges who judge by bringing upon us great disaster. That's the Babylonians and Assyrians capturing Jerusalem and the north. And under the whole heaven has such never been done as what was done to Jerusalem. Do you see where God's focal point and Daniel's is? Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, do you remember? It says in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 26, all of those curses and doom upon the the disobedience of Israel. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. What a great example of, of how God wants us to pray. Therefore, Lord, keep the disaster in mind. We have not obeyed his voice. Now look how he changes in verse 15 to thanksgiving. Adoration started. Lots of confession. Now thanksgiving. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. So he's saying, thank you for the exodus. Thank you for the deliverance, the Passover. Thank you for bringing us into the land. Thank you for all you did in providing us the promised land. But we have sinned and done wickedly. You know, that's so interesting. In American Christianity, we have very little confession and lots of supplication, you know, asking for things and some adoration. Daniel greatly beloved to the Lord, had, you know, real pointed adoration, but an awful lot of confession. He looked into the mirror of the Word of God and saw much that needed to be changed. Then he starts into the prayer request. O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, and here are his requests. Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city of Jerusalem. That's interesting. Your holy mountain, because of our sins and iniquities of our Father, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach. He's concerned about God's city, where God has put his name, and God has has said, this is where I will dwell forever. Now, therefore, our God, verse 17, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication for for the Lord's sake, which cause your face to shine on your sanctuary which is desolate. Hmm. Oh my God, incline your ears, hear, open your eyes, see our desolation, and the city which is called by your name. 
your holy mountain, Jerusalem, your sanctuary, your city. Do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercy. See, I don't, I don't pray expecting you to respond because of my righteousness, because of your character, your attributes, he's saying. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. It's all about the Lord. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord for the holy mountain, I mean, he's really laying it on how God looks at Jerusalem. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, now he gets the archangel visit. Remember, there are two archangels. Arche are the high or exalted or, you know, kind of preeminent ones among the, the billions of angels. And probably there are seven of them because they're called seven angels of the face that always surround the throne of God. We see them in Revelation twice. Uh, but here's two of them. They have names. Michael, Gabriel. Okay. And this is Gabriel. And he said, um, whom I'd seen at the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he, by the way, the evening offering was at 3 p.m. That's when Christ uh, said it is finished. Uh, they didn't mean evening dark. They meant at the beginning of the preparation for sunset, they had an offering at 3 p.m. And he said to me and talked with me, or he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give you skill and understanding. Wow. There's a little insight. Angels can give skill to understand, and they do that to the scripture writers. And it, this is just an example of it. Uh, look how God looks at Daniel. You're greatly beloved. Wow. Now we're entering into something, and I want to show it to you. Just I'm, I'm typing this out just so you have time to see it and can screenshot it if you want to. We're entering into what makes this not only an incredible model of what a godly person's prayer life looks like and how they study prophecy and all the other elements, how they hear the voice of God when they read the Bible. There's something else. This is probably the greatest single prophetic passage in the whole Bible. I'm going to show you uh, why. We're at minute 27, I see over here. First, we get a scope of what God is doing. Then he talks about a time period called 69 weeks that culminates with Messiah being cut off. It's actually a prophecy of the cross of Christ. Now, right there, to have a countdown that exactly was fulfilled, I'm going to show you right to the day when Jesus offered himself on Palm Sunday Jesus was exactly in step with Daniel's prophecy. Wow. Then there's a, an interval. There's a time period that nothing is happening. And then Daniel says, 69 of these weeks are used up. One week is left. And he describes that in verse 27. Have you ever wondered where we get the seven-year tribulation from? Does it say that anywhere? No. You can't find seven-year tribulation anywhere except in prophecy books, theology books, study Bibles. It's not in the Bible. It's kind of like the word rapture. That's not in the Bible either. Now, rapture is a Latin word, rapturos, which comes from a Greek word, harpazo, which means to snatch out, which is what we mean by rapture. But we have to be precise because people can accuse us and say, millennium isn't in the Bible. You're right. That word isn't in the Bible, but millennium is. That's the Latin translation of the thousand years. So what people accuse is usually partially true. And when Christians haven't studied the Bible, they get nervous and they go, oh, maybe I don't understand. You do understand. There is a seven-year tribulation. Let's see that in the scriptures. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, end sins, make reconciliation, everlasting righteousness, vision, to anoint the most holy. Now he starts explaining. Remember, first we have the scope. That's why I just read 70 weeks. 
Then he starts explaining the components. Then he talks about a gap. Then he talks about that climactic week. So right here, therefore, go and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. That's Jesus coming into Jerusalem on what we just celebrated a month back uh, or so of Palm Sunday, his triumphal entry as the king of the Jews. Remember Hosanna, save us. They were asking for him to be their Messiah. Shall be seven weeks plus 62 weeks. So 62 plus seven is 69. And it says in this time, the street will be built and the wall even in troublesome times. So he says, from the command to restore Jerusalem till Messiah comes as king in the triumphal entry would be 69 weeks. 69 weeks of 360 day years. So what we're talking about is weeks of years. This is what a week is. It's actually not the Hebrew word for a week. It's the word for heptad. If you've ever heard of heptad, it means a group of seven. I'll show you that in just a minute. So basically, there is this verse 25, 69 weeks. That's seven plus 62. Then verse 26, we're going to see, talks about this interval where Messiah is cut off and these people come and destroy the temple. And then he says, after all that interval will be this final week. This is what we call the tribulation, the 70th week. The, the heptad is seven years. This is where the seven years come from. And I'll show you that. The 70th week, this is the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. This is Jesus being crucified on the cross. This is the rapture of the church right there. This is the seven-year tribulation. It's two halves, three and a half years, three and a half years, 42 months, and 1260 days. So the tribulation has two parts. It has a certain center. And that's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, 15. He said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing in the holy place, let those in Jerusalem flee to the mountains. This is the tribulation. It's the 70th week. That's what makes this such an important. So here it is. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That's the crucifixion. I wrote in my Bible, but not for himself. That's the core of salvation, the substitutionary atonement. And the people of the prince who is to come, that's the Antichrist, shall destroy the city, that's Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, that's the temple. When did that happen? A.D. 70. So who destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70? The Romans. So the people of the prince that is to come are the Romans. That's going to be interesting for you to think about uh, when we talk about prophecy. And the end will come with a flood until the end, war, desolations. Then he, who is the he? He is the prince who is to come right here. What is he? He is the leader of the revived Roman Empire or the Antichrist. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. That one week is the seven-year tribulation. And what happens is everything gets worse and worse and all this trouble is happening and ethnic strife and everything. And all of a sudden, this global leader rises. And he is so brilliant and such an effective communicator that just like the whole world stopped for this pandemic, have you ever seen anything like what just happened in the last year? Have you ever seen the whole world stop, global travel stop, everybody stay home? Uh, the whole world came to a standstill. You can see from satellites, the, the world changed. Satellites determined that there was, there was so many changes on the earth. Animals started multiplying. Things started growing back. Harbors started changing. All of the, the earthquake uh, detection systems found so much less noise. They said that the earth went silent because the humans just basically paused for a year, most of our activity. If you think the pandemic was hard, can you imagine when one person rises up 
that starts controlling the whole world, and you can't buy or sell unless he allows you to, and if you don't agree with him, he beheads you? Wow. That's who we're talking about right there. He confirms the covenant. The way he rises to power is he settles the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Islamic Judaism conflict. He stops all the terror, all the warfare, all the nuclear proliferation, all of the WMDs and the whole climate problem and the whole food problem. He just steps in. And the Bible says that he comes on a white horse, Revelation 6, and is a peacemaker and he causes everybody to settle down and all the ethnic strife to stop. We don't have any more riots and burning and pillaging, none of that stuff. And there's this false peace. And he lets Israel worship in Jerusalem like they've always wanted to. And in the middle of the week, that's the middle of the tribulation, he brings an end, look at this, to sacrifice and offering. There's going to be a temple in Jerusalem offering animal sacrifice. That's what Daniel saw. That's what Jesus saw in Matthew 24. That's what Paul saw in 2 Thessalonians 2. That's what John sees in Revelation 11. And then it's all going to come down hard. The second half of the tribulation is horrible. You say, well, where do you get all this weak stuff and seven years means something else? I thought we weren't supposed to be allegorical. We're not. I'm being literal. 70 weeks, if you look at that little, there's a little footnote right there, and go down to the bottom, this is what it says. The word translated weeks in English is the Hebrew word for heptad, or a group of seven, not to be confused with over here. Look at this. In chapter 10, the, the occurrences of the word weeks is not the same. These are not the same. This word is not weeks, it's heptads. This word is word is weeks like we know it, seven days. Two completely different Hebrew words. God says, I've determined 70 groups of seven for my people. And those are in two parts. 483 years from that command to the crucifixion, and then the last seven that we just saw. Okay, now, this is all my notes typed, just to show you I did my homework. We're on week 23. I titled this, The Greatest Prophetic Passage in the Bible. I titled it, Jesus, Daniel, Paul, and John, All Saw an End of Days Temple. I already caught, talked to you about how this literal studying by Daniel is how he started his prayer. Um, Daniel, in, and I showed you that, 539 to 538, was doing prophetic Bible study. He responded with his prayer and supplication. He starts the Acts model. Uh, he, he gives adoration to the Lord. He starts the confession time. Uh, then, as he read God's word, he says he heard God's voice. Do you see everything that I, I basically, uh, on one of my read-throughs, I, I don't write anything in my journal. I just note everything in the text. So I never forget what I found. Uh, Daniel's 70 weeks are heptads, not to be confused with the word weeks. Uh, cut off is a substitutionary atonement. The revived Roman Empire prince, the people to come are the Roman Empire. Daniel saw a temple, and so did Jesus, so did Paul, so did John. How do you apply one of the greatest chapters in the Bible? Well, let me just give one example. This is my last prayer. This is this morning's prayer. This is what I prayed as I, in the dark this morning, was drinking my first cup of coffee, reading the Bible, and meditating on how God's Word can transform my heart. I wrote this, Lord, I adore you as my God and King. You are great and worthy of all my adoration and worship. I too have often not heeded your voice and your word. So please forgive and cleanse me. You are awesome. You keep your word. I want to hear your voice. I want to obey your word. I want to trust your plan. Guide me to do your will and accomplish your purpose in my life. Thank you for literally explaining the future in such simple terms. I can understand 
and trust that you're in control. For Jesus' sake, amen. Isn't it wonderful to know that the Lord is in control? Remember, this is where we are in sacred history. I always want you to realize that we're talking about real people in real places with real problems that lived historically. Everything happens sometime. When is this book? From the 70 years of captivity. It's right in this time from when Babylon conquered Jerusalem on is this 70 year period. Uh, as I told you last time, um, Nebuchadnezzar started his first siege. The Babylonians came in 605 BC and hauled off Daniel. The Babylonians came back to Israel. They left a contingent and it was occupied. But in 597, they besieged Jerusalem a second time and hauled off Ezekiel. That's who we saw last week. So Daniel gets to Babylon first. Ezekiel gets there second. And then in the third siege, which is in 586, the city was leveled. The people were massacred. And all these theological designation events take place. There's the servitude of the nation, the 70 years that Israel had to suffer. There's the desolation of Jerusalem, which is the time period that there had to be no sacrifice and no offering of offerings. One ended with Cyrus, the head of the Persian Empire. The other ended with Artaxerxes, but that's what triggers the 70-week countdown. And in the middle of this, next time, Lord willing, uh, after you study Daniel 9 all this week, next week, when we come back, Lord willing, we're going to look at Zechariah 12 to 14, which is the ultimate description with details nowhere else in the Bible of the second coming of Jesus Christ. After Zechariah is the time of Esther, and Esther is right here during the time of Nehemiah. See, Ezra came back, then Nehemiah. Remember we studied Ezra in, um, uh, when we were looking at Psalm 119? So Ezra, Psalm 119, and copying the scriptures, Nehemiah building the wall, Esther is over in Persia, and then, of course, the concluding of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. Uh, you see, the historically, the kings of Persia, uh, the, the ones, they're all in different ones in history mentioned. Ezra 1 talks about Cyrus the Great, so does Isaiah 45, that 200-year-before prophecy. Ahasuerus, Ezra 4, Artaxerxes, Ezra 4, um, this Darius the first or uh, Histopsis is in Ezra 5 and 6. Here is Queen Esther's husband, Xerxes the first. Uh, Artaxerxes, uh, Longamanus, is in Nehemiah 2. Nehemiah 12 has this Darius the second, and Darius the third is in Nehemiah 12 also. So just to show you, when you go to a museum, which is something Bonnie and I love to do. I love to go to museums and find the artifacts that tie in with the scriptures. Uh, real quickly, what I've just shared is kind of amazing. If you have time to study the rest of Daniel, if you study chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 11, Daniel is the most attacked book of the Bible as far as the, the authenticity of it. Why? Well, let's, let's look at what Jesus said. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus authenticates Daniel. He gave uh, Daniel a strong endorsement. Daniel is the only Old Testament prophet that Jesus calls by name when he talks about the future. In his longest sermon, the Olivet Discourse, which is in Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So Jesus was a fan of Daniel's. And what he said is, Daniel was a Jew. He was alive in the 6th century BC empire of Babylon. He served at the highest levels in the closing days of Babylon and was there at the opening days of the Medo-Persian empire. In other words, Jesus said that what Daniel uh, says about who he is, when he lived, and what he saw is true. Now there's the bottom line. When people ask me how I know the Bible's true, do you know what I tell them? The number one biggest reasons why I believe, I have seven reasons why I believe the Bible's true. 
The first and most important and the only one I need is Jesus believed it was true. Okay? So, Jesus affirms Daniel. And Daniel says that the world is going to be ruled by four great empires. It's going to culminate with the rise of the Antichrist, and it's going to end with the return of the real Christ. That's a summary of Daniel 2 and 9, okay? Uh, Let me just go over this with you. God sees only four world empires. Were there other empires? You bet there were. They're in the Bible. There's, There's the Assyrian Empire. There's the Egyptian Empire. There's the Arameans. There are all these different people that are all over the place. The Hittites. There's a whole Hittite empire. By the way, it wasn't even really believed it was true, even though it's in the Bible, until the 20th century. Did you know archaeologists didn't really believe there were Hittites? If you look at old encyclopedias before about 1910, they said the Hittites. Well, in fact, Wikipedia says it. Wikipedia says until about 1910, The Hittites were only in the Bible. But a German industrialist in World War I was building a factory in Turkey. He went to the bar to have a beer, and he heard the Turks talking at the bar about these gigantic stone figures they found out in the desert. So he hired them to take him out in the desert, and there they were, huge, larger-than-life animals with human faces. So he hired 200 of them, he was a rich German industrialist, to start digging. And they uncovered the first of the Hittite Empire's gigantic cities that had been buried for thousands of years. So the Bible says there are lots of empires, but in Daniel 2, God gives an overview of human history from his perspective, so we as humans can understand the human perspective of what God sees, and with all their outward beauty and accomplishments, look what he says. He says, from God's perspective, the first real big glitzy empire was Babylon. The second empire, inferior in in glitziness, you know, just like gold is more valuable than silver, is the second empire, the Medo-Persian. Look at this, inferior, I mean gold, Silver, brass. I mean, we make our plumbing out of brass. Well, now it's plastic, but it used to be out of brass, okay? That is Greece. Then iron. See, it's it's declining value, but increasing strength. And the Roman Empire is the final empire. There are only four. From God's perspective, all of human history in, is, is encompassed by Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. But look at what the ending is going to be. Rome number two, the revived Roman Empire. Now, what's interesting is this is from human perspective, gold and silver. But from divine or God's perspective, Daniel 7 is the same vision, only in a different form. A winged lion, a bear, a leopard, and a terrible beast. God sees human history as rapacious and and horribly murderous, and violent, and monster-like, and and humans just think of glory and splendor, because they look at the architecture and all the gold vessels, and God looks at the heart. But God sees four empires, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and clay, and the iron and clay are the end times. And what God says is, just like the Roman Empire had two legs, do you know what that is? The Roman Empire was kind of divided between the north shore of the Mediterranean, and the south shore of the Mediterranean. And basically, the rule of thumb is, if you look at the ancient Roman Empire, two-thirds of the Roman Empire of the Bible times today is Islamic. Northern Africa, Turkey, and the Middle East. So it could be that the revived Roman Empire is going to be in the geographic area of the original Roman Empire, but it's going to be predominantly Islamic. That could explain the beheading of all the tribulation saints. Uh, We cover that in Revelation, by the way. But the leader of that final revived Roman Empire, the see what it says in chapter 9 of Daniel? The people of the prince, verse 26, that destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, that's the Roman. 
Empire, the revived Roman Empire says, he, that's this prince that will come, uh, from verse 26, will make the covenant. Who is he? The Antichrist. Who is he? The worst human that ever lives. He's called by, in different books of the Bible, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the false Christ. So basically, Daniel talks about a 69-week time that culminates with Christ's crucifixion. Uh, then the people of the Roman Empire destroy the sanctuary, and there's this time period that goes by. Jesus ascends to heaven here. Jesus takes his church out here. The Antichrist starts ruling here. He is an abomination that causes desolation. He allows the Jews to start their temple. They get to keep the temple till the middle. Then all hell breaks loose when he breaks the covenant, and all the great tribulation takes place. Uh, this rebuilt temple that some, you know, it's, it's actually, he allows them to start doing sacrifices here. So the temple is rebuilt somewhere at the very beginning of the tribulation, desecrated in the middle. And then the Battle of Armageddon, remember we talked last week about the Magog invasion. Jesus comes in the second coming to rescue his chosen people of promise and to launch his kingdom. So, Jesus said there will be a temple operating in Jerusalem at the start of the tribulation. Wow. Bonnie and I thank you for joining us on this year-long study through the scriptures. I was talking to her today. Um, our daytime job is we are, what it says right here, uh, doing classes. Uh, we alternate between real classes pre-COVID, uh, B.C., before COVID, uh, we traveled uh, 11 months a year to five continents, going from training center to training center and teaching. Then AC, after COVID, we immediately in March of 2020, uh, when we got back from our last trip, started in our virtual studio teaching the same classes. And all of those, by the way, are now online, as I said to you a couple weeks ago. Uh, on YouTube, and you can find each of the books of the Bible that we teach through as formal courses with all the quizzes and assignments and everything for you to actually take a, a full course. But we're now starting back, and we're on the road now, and, and now as we're teaching, uh, still doing virtual classes, but soon to be going overseas and going to teaching centers. But we are after work at night once a week, recording for you, our small group, this Bible study. And I told Bonnie today, I said, did you know for five years, I always wanted to capture what I talked about at Starbucks and Panera and Chipotle with all those groups, showing them and explaining the Bible and showing them how to journal and, and do the devotional method in their application prayer. I want to capture that. And you know what the Lord did? He sent COVID. <laughs> a byproduct of this shutdown is us getting the time to do this study with you and to, to actually have you as our partners uh, praying for us. I actually talk to you um, on a regular basis more than anybody else because we're traveling all the time. So I would encourage you to pray for us. This is our prayer card. This is these pictures show where we kind of alternate between teaching. And we would like to know that we feel your prayers. In fact, thank you. One of you in the Netherlands last night sent me a note and said, turn down your microphone. There's too much something, interference, and it makes this loud sound. And you know what? I called my son and I said, what is he talking about? And he says, dad, you have to go into your computer and you have it set at 12 decibels and it really should only be at six on the, the actual microphone coming in through all this sound studio. I said, wow, I'm so thankful for you in the Netherlands, part of our small group, helping us to communicate more clearly. Hey, have a great week in Daniel chapter seven. Take your notes, write your prayer, ask God to change you. And Lord willing, when we come back next week, we're going to look at the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds in Zechariah 12 to 14. Till then, God bless you. Have a great time in his word.